Now, our next speaker, who's also a journalist as well as a professor, comes to us from Moscow. For many years, Sergei Medvedev has closely studied Russia and investment in the Arctic and the social, economic, and military activity, as we've just been hearing in that region. He's author of a new award-winning book called The Return of the Russian Leviathan. Pertinent to our topic today, his view is that Russian governments have not lived up to their special responsibilities in the Arctic. His preferred model for governance of the Arctic would be very different from the one now in place. And I think he's here to tell us more about that. Let's just see if we can get him on the line. Welcome to the Cameron Conference, Professor, and we look forward to hearing your talk about Russia's symbolic politics in the Arctic. Over to you. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, David, and hello, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be <clears throat> speaking there, especially now in the middle of this, you know, very wintry winter, which we have in Russia, because we've had like the coldest and uh, most snow-rich winter we've had in decades. Uh, well, indeed, uh, there was, I had some, uh, you know, ideas about a special governance regime in the Arctic, uh, but I think I will go to this towards the end of my presentation. And um, before, I wanted to try to um, understand uh, the essence of the Russian approach to the Arctic uh, in a historical perspective and in a symbolic perspective in order to understand uh, what are the Arctic really means for Russia and uh, what kinds of uh, politics and projects and uh, um, mythologies have been there about the Arctic. So uh, I would like to start with uh, three symbolic episodes uh, from uh, the past uh, 15 years that which we've had in the Arctic, which got uh, global attention. Can I have first slide, please? Uh, okay, this is this is the plan of my presentation. Uh, so first, I will just tell about the symbolic episodes of Russian uh, politics in the Arctic. Then I will talk about the Arctic legacy, which is colonization, modernization, and currently devastation. Um, then I will talk about Russia's plans for the Arctic, uh, Russia's claims, many of which are mostly empty and hollow. And indeed, I will try to argue in the end that Russia's investment in the Arctic is indeed very symbolic, not practical, but symbolic. It's about geopolitical greatness, it's about the territoriality, sovereignty, but not about really uh, any practical development plans. Uh, the first slide, please. So this is something which happened uh, 14 years ago in 2007, uh, when Russia had a high profile uh, submarine uh, expedition by a uh, famous polar explorer and State Duma deputy, Artur Shilingarov, who went down in a uh, submersible vehicle, uh, planting the titanium flag on the seabed in the Arctic. Uh, and this was in order, it was not just, you know, uh, claiming uh, Russia's sovereignty, but it was about uh, a territorial, a uh, seabed territorial dispute, the uh, Lomonosov Bridge, trying to uh, argue that the Lomonosov Bridge, which is uh, starts from the Russian continental shelf, which essentially, in the terms of the sea law, of the maritime law, makes the entire area around this ridge, uh, which is very resource rich, which is very oil rich, belonging to Russia. And mind you, the Lomonosov Bridge uh, runs uh, to the Baffin Island in Canada. So we're talking about like most of the territory of the, uh, of the Arctic Basin. So uh, this was televised live, and it was really presented as a very uh, important uh, Russian uh, exploration, like planting the titanium flag in the Arctic. So this was the first display of sovereignty. Uh, the second one, uh, can we have the uh, next slide, please? It was the head of the Sochi Olympics in uh, 2014. And before this, this was the Olympic torch relay which was sort of, um, I would say, funny. It was like the longest Olympic torch relay in history, something like 50,000 kilometers. And Russia was like marking the perimeter of its sovereignty. And this perimeter included, among other things, uh, outer space, because the torch was taken to the International Space Station. 
in a special, they call it uh, Lampade Lantern. Uh, it was taken to the Kuril Island. It was, you know, all the perimeter of the Russian North and the Russian Far East. It was taken to the top of uh, Mount Elbrus. Uh, it was taken to this bottom of uh, Lake Baikal. Uh, some people were swimming across the Yenisei River with the torch. And among other things, this was taken to the North Pole. Although technically North Pole is not Russian territory. But still, the Olympic torch was taken to the North Pole, and you see this episode here. It was taken by this, uh, you know, nuclear-powered icebreaker, and uh, there was like a part of the relay going around the North Pole. So it's interesting how this display of sovereignty occurred. And then, uh, next slide, please. Uh, later the same year, uh, this was uh, this uh, famous or rather infamous attack by the Russian border troops on Greenpeace, our Arctic Sunrise boat. Uh, which was approaching uh, the Russian uh, drilling platform uh, in the Kara Sea. And uh, this was uh, Russia's um, you know, prime uh, drilling site uh, for the new uh, oil region, oil rich region, and it carried a significant environmental risk. And the Greenpeace wanted to attract global attention to this, and they approached the platform, and then they were attacked by the uh, Russian helicopters, and uh, some, you know, people landed there. Uh, the uh, um, uh, border guards landed there, and then uh, these uh, the crew of uh, Arctic Sunrise was taken into custody, conv convoyed to Murmansk. Uh, they were charged with terrorism first, uh, and uh, they spent uh, two and a half months in Russian custody, and they were like in an act of uh, pardon uh, released uh, before Christmas 2030. And this was once again a very significant, uh, and I would say excessive display of Russian sovereignty claiming Russian stake in the Arctic. But I would say my, my point here is these, these were quintessentially very symbolic acts. I mean, they had to do with the symbols of sovereignty, with symbols of territoriality, of Russia's geopolitical greatness. So Arc the Arctic was used as a vehicle, as a platform for displaying this um, uh, symbolical things. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this indeed has to do with um, centuries of uh, Russia's uh, involvement with the area. Because of course we had centuries of colonization and uh, uh, Russian uh, colonial um, odyssey in, the, in Siberia and also in the Arctic. Uh, for Russia, that was like the, like the American frontier, this was the Russian frontier. But whereas in Siberia, there was clearly the uh, resource, the resource urge, right? Russia was going after fur, which was Russia's oil and gas for centuries, 16th, 17th uh, century. Uh, Russia was the prime uh, supply of fur in the global markets. Uh, but the Arctic was had much more to do with um, a symbolic exploration, because it was about acquiring territory without a clear practical reason. It was territory for territory's sake. It was sovereignty for sovereignty's sake. There were no people there. It was just barren land. It was like the exploration of the moon. So indeed, you know, much of the Russian involvement in the area is, I think it has a similarity of the moon. Russia ended with this, you know, huge, um, largely unusable territory, um, but it takes a special pride in possessing this territory in order to say that we have the one-seventh of the world's land mass. One-sixth was in the Soviet Union, Russia got into the was seventh. So there were centuries and centuries of exploration, heroic acts, uh, the wise breakers uh, stranded in ice, uh, they were expeditions lost and perished. And um, indeed it was going on. And, uh, and once again, I would say that the Arctic didn't carry any serious practical reason for Russia, and any serious practical value except for strategic. And uh, then came the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, it was actually some kind of a modernist utopia uh, because it was about developing the Arctic territory. It was like crazy from an environmental point of view, a crazy plan of, uh, you know, melting the Arctic, having the uh, cherry orchards grow in the Arctic, 
turning the current of the Arctic rivers so that they are not, you know, throwing the water into the Arctic basin, but rather to turn them into the arid lands in uh, South Russia and in Central Asia um, and so on. So there was some, you know, crazy environmental uh, exploits there, many of which, you know, came to nothing. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was uh, a very symbolic activity by Russia for centuries in the Arctic. Um, and um, uh, the, another part, uh, another usage of the Arctic was, next slide please. Um, okay, this is about Soviet modernization, so we can go to the next slide, since also time is pressing. Uh, because the Arctic also became a penitentiary space. It's in general about Russia's relations with its own space. The space is seen as a punishment. It's interesting, there's some kind of schizophrenia, schizophrenia in the national mind. Because on the one hand, we uh, take it, you know, it's God's gift to Russia, right? We have this tremendous territory. But then as you come to think of it, much of this territory, I would say nine-tenths of this territory is seen as a kind of a punishment. Because if you want to punish somebody in Russia, he or she is sent to Siberia. Like Siberia in Russia is a shortcut for uh, for punishment, for prison, uh, for galleys, for the disappearance of the people, right? People are disappearing without trace in this barren frozen lands. So it's interesting, rather than seeing it as, you know, as a natural rich, uh, natural riches, we see it as a land of... Uh, you know, losing uh, losing people, of uh, people, uh, you know, sending people uh, to be lost there, to perish there. And of course, the Gulag legacy is very big in the Arctic because much of the Arctic infrastructure was built by the slave labor. And, you know, Gulag, we're talking about at least 20 million people that went through the labor camps between uh, 1920s and 1950s, of which uh, unspecified number is something, I think, uh, say about 3 million people perished in this. And many Arctic roads are really literally built on Boats, the you know tens of thousands of people under each kilometer lying there in permafrost, and many of the mining towns. But indeed, you know, much of this legacy, once the gulag is gone, uh, you know, it came to the uh, very um. Can I, in the next next slide, please, because the uh, present um, day. Um, actually, next slide. I will come back to this uh, Siberian curse. It uh, really. Uh, carries uh, some devastation in, uh, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, because uh, after the Gulag is gone, after the strategic necessity is gone, after you know the necessity of the Cold War of placing uh, the strategic uh, missiles there, of you know the landing strips for the land lease uh, um, air supplies that were going there, um, much of this has been withdrawn in the 21st century. Right, and uh, today's uh, landscape of the Arctic is very much a uh, barren land, and there are many ghost cities, like, uh, for instance, next slide, please, the city of Varkuta, um, which you see here, and um, because the coal is no longer there, coal is no longer needed, and many roads uh, that were built there, uh, they are unsustainable, they cannot stay in permafrost, you know, the railroads cannot, you know, stay there in permafrost. So really, some much of the Arctic legacy is a devastation. And indeed, as Fiona Hill and Cliff Gaddy called it, the, it's, uh, can we have two slides back? Uh, it's called The Siberian Curse. There is this wonderful book by them, and uh, they said that really Siberia and the Arctic is a curse for Russia. They measure the, the TPC, temperature per capita, uh, of Russia and Canada. And it turned out that Canada in the 20th century turned out to be a warmer country and Russia a colder country. Russia became, by the end of the century, became something like a four degrees uh, Celsius colder than the beginning of the century. And that's not because of the climate change. It's because Russia has relocated millions of people into the barren lands of the Arctic for purely strategic purposes, right? For, you know, these crazy dreams of the communist utopia of manning the barren lands there, either as Gulag convicts or as this uh, Komsomol construction sites building the cities there. But now in the 21st century, it's no longer sustainable. And many people are just, you know, stranded there. Uh, so uh, this brings me to the idea that much of the Russian um, policy, much of the Russian history there has been about symbols rather than the actual development of the Arctic. I will try to run through the remaining slides. Can you have two, three, I think three slides forward? Okay, so there are basically three big um, 
Okay, time wise, so the donor threshold. Can I be allowed um, a three minutes extra above this 15 minutes? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so um, basically, um, Russia's uh, grand plans for the Arctic these days, uh, they came down uh, to three. One is the territorial claim, uh, and Russia is claiming almost as much as uh, two million square kilometers of Arctic waters, part of this as you know, the claim on the Lomonosov Bridge. But you know, it's basically, I think we'll be discussing this later, that's basically like a stalemate because there are conflicting claims from Denmark by Greenland. There is a conflicting claim from, um, from Canada. So um, unless, and the UN Commission can't really rule on this unless there is a con consensus among the claiming parties. So I think Russian claim there has been there for already 20 years and it goes nowhere. So it's very much, you know, publicized in the Russian press and the Russian propaganda that we're like claiming the Arctic, but indeed it, you know, comes to nothing. Next slide, please. Another is, you know, that this is Alibaba's cave, you know, the oil of the Arctic, uh, the gas of the Arctic. But you know, the actual fact that was oil standing at $50 a barrel or even 60 or even any price below $200 a barrel, Russia's oil exploration uh, in the Arctic is unsustainable, right? Uh, it cannot, uh, you know, Russia first does not have the resources. Russia does not have the technology. So basically all Russian uh, 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 platforms are really written off Norwegian platforms because Russia cannot really build these platforms for the Arctic. So in the current land, the sanctions, Russia does not have the technology, Russia does not have the money, Russia does not have the, the, have the investment. So this, this whole big scam, I would say, uh, this entire Russian story of uh, Russia's Arctic oil, and it is no coincidence that after the sanctions of 2014, 2015, after Crimea annexation, all major Western companies have withdrawn from the Arctic. So Russia remains there on her own. And indeed, this is, has much more to do with the market capitalization of the Russian companies. Because they get government money, for instance, for developing uh, the new sites, the new spots. They get government money for building their icebreaker fleet. So the market value of uh, Gazprom neft or of uh, Rosneft, it increases but it has nothing to do with the actual oil exploration in the Arctic. So this is like a private strategy of certain uh, companies. Next slide, please. Uh, the Northern Sea route, it looks great on the map. It's 5,000 miles shorter than the South route. So from Yokohama to Rotterdam, of course, it's closer to get it via the Arctic than via the Suez Canal around the world. But the actual fact that there is no infrastructure there, uh, the waters are not chartered. Uh, they are still drifting ice. There are no lighthouses. Uh, there is no. There are no ports there. And accessing these ports through the permafrost will be uh, great difficult. So it's actually like once again navigating through the moon, and uh, let alone the risks, for instance, of bringing oil in the Arctic waters. Because as you understand, the oil spill in the Arctic. It's like nothing compared with the uh, Gulf of Mexico because the oil does not uh, you know, decompose in the Arctic waters. It will stay there forever. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, let's skip the military plans. I think it's once again for Russia's you know, budget uh, purposes of you know, making some lucrative military contracts uh, because there's no really terrorism threat to any territorial threat for Russia's in the Arctic. And uh, the final slides. Uh, so Russia's Arctic plans are mostly empty and hollow. They're all about symbols. They're all about Russia's geopolitical greatness, all about Russia's claims. So in the end, I would say that the Arctic was in the past centuries, and as of today, it remains a symbolic space, a space for uh, displaying Russia's territorial ambition, Russia's greatness a uh, platform on which to negotiate with the Western partners. But it has very little to do with the practical uh, feeling of this, um, of this Arctic space, uh, with the practical development. But then, you know, it happens so in Russia. Russia is such as a project, as a nation, it's very symbolically rich. It's a country where symbols very often replace reality. You've heard of Potemkin villages, right? So this is a very Russian invention. So Russia's Arctic strategy, I think, by and large, is one more Pachonkin village, uh, which has much to do with displays for the sovereign, 
but has very little to do with the practical uh, content of it. So I'll be happy to discuss this later on. Well, thank you. Thank you for allotting the extra time.